Hello everyone, welcome to the Lang Focus channel and my name is Paul. Today we're going to look at a wild way of studying kanji. If you don't know what kanji are, they are ideographic characters that are used to write words or parts of words in Japanese. They are originally Chinese but were adopted into Japanese as well. You don't read a kanji like an alphabet letter, but you look at it as a symbol or a series of symbols that represent a meaning. And if you know the word that matches that meaning, then you can pronounce the kanji when you read it. Of course, there's a bit more to it than that, but that's the gist of it. But since they are ideographs and not pictures, kanji usually don't contain visually concrete images. Check out this one, meaning apologize. How does that mean apologize? They can be visually complex, containing many different parts, and basic adult literacy in Japanese requires knowledge of around 2,000 kanji. And literacy in Chinese requires many more. How can you remember how to read and write thousands of visually complex characters like this? Children in Japan drill them like crazy from kindergarten through high school using simple brute force rote memorization. But what if you're a gaijin who doesn't want to spend 12 years learning how to read kanji? There are some strategies we can use to gain a working knowledge of kanji in a much shorter amount of time. One method was created by James W. Heisig and presented in his book Remembering the Kanji. Let me start with an example. This kanji means elder brother, in other words, older brother. It has two components. This piece, which means mouth on its own, and these two strokes, which kind of look like human legs. This gives us an image of a mean older brother who never shuts up. He's just a big mouth walking around on two legs, saying annoying mean things. Since most kanji consist of various shapes arranged in different ways, Heisek assigns a keyword to each of those shapes, and you can use those keywords to create a mnemonic story, a story or image that helps you remember the meaning of that kanji. Heisig refers to these shapes or kanji components as primitives. As we can see in this example, some primitives are standalone kanji on their own, like this one meaning mouth, while others do not appear on their own, only as a component of a larger kanji, like this one for human legs. Another such primitive that only appears in other kanji is this one. Heisig gives this primitive the keyword devil. You can see that it contains the character meaning older brother. When this character appears as a primitive in another kanji, we can modify its meaning slightly to teenager to give us access to a wider range of images and stories. So this is an image of a teenager with two horns on his head. There are plenty of adults who think that teenagers are the devil. They look at them and imagine devil horns on their head. I guess that's because of teenagers' evil behavior. Oh my gosh, why are these teenagers standing in front of 7-Eleven? This kanji means undress. It contains the primitive meaning devil, or evil teenager, and another piece which means moon on its own. But you know what? To moon is also a transitive verb meaning to show your bare butt to someone as a prank. So as a primitive, I mean as part of another kanji, this component can take on the meaning of flesh or body part. Those are the keywords chosen by Heisig, but I think bare butt works too. So we know that this kanji clearly means undress because it shows an evil teenager possessed by the devil stripping down to his bare butt. Or her bare butt. Or, insert your pronoun here, bare butt. By the way, just like bare butt, evil teenager is my idea and not the exact keyword given by Heisig. When I used his method, I changed some of the keywords in the book to ones that were more memorable to me. He recommends you don't do that, but, well, I did it. You just have to make sure your personally chosen keywords aren't used for other kanji or primitives. This kanji means pointed, as in sharp. It contains the primitive meaning devil or evil teenager, same thing really, and this one on the left meaning metal, which also appears on its own meaning gold. The word pointed refers to those sharp metal objects that evil teenagers possessed by the devil carry in their pockets so they can rob all the innocent adults, or even worse. Why are some of these kanji stories so insane or ridiculous? Look at what I wrote on the inside cover of my copy of Remembering the Kanji. Do not read these stories without my permission. Many are intentionally disturbing to aid memorization. And yes, I realize that my handwriting here might be just as disturbing. The stories for these kanji don't always have to be insane or shocking. You just need to imagine a vivid, memorable image. This kanji means storm. The bottom component means wind, and the top one means mountain. Both of these exist as independent kanji as well. For this kanji, I imagine a storm so powerful that the wind tears a mountain out of the ground and sends it flying into the air. That's why the mountain is on top of the wind. See, as long as you come up with a vivid image, it doesn't have to be shocking. <coughs> 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 
This right here is a kanji meaning large, but when it appears as a primitive in other kanji, Heisig recommends using the keyword Saint Bernard, a kind of dog. But that's kind of lame. How's this for an alternative? Godzilla! How can you not come up with a memorable image using Godzilla? But I suppose you could use another large beast like King Kong or something. This kanji means stinking. The bottom component is Godzilla, and the top component means nose, which also appears on its own with its own story. Imagine Godzilla roaming around your city with his nose in the air, sniffing for the smell of humans to eat. People with stinking body odor are the ones he'll find first, and tear them limb from limb with his sharp teeth. This kanji means person, but when it appears as a primitive in other kanji, you can choose a specific person who's very memorable to you. When I did the Remembering the Kanji course, I used a childhood friend of mine who was always getting into trouble because I had lots of stories about him. But since you're watching and you don't know my friend, let me choose a new memorable person right now. How about Arnold Schwarzenegger? This kanji means rest. When the person primitive appears on the left side of a kanji, its shape is slightly modified, like it's been squeezed into a narrower space. This primitive on the right means tree, and also appears on its own as an independent kanji. You might be thinking, okay, Arnold Schwarzenegger is sitting under a tree, resting. Yeah, that's fine, but that's kinda lame. Arnold Schwarzenegger has been pulling trees right out of the ground and chopping them up into wood with his bare hands all day, so now he needs to rest. After resting for a solid 30 seconds, Arnie stands up again and starts uprooting more trees, feeling well rested. This kanji means dwell, as in to live in a place. This component on the right takes on the visual keyword of candlestick when it's a primitive. As a kanji on its own, it means lord and has its own story. Back when he dwelled in Austria, Arnold Schwarzenegger was very poor and dwelled in a little shack with no electricity. Instead, he set a three meter tall candlestick inside the shack so that he could dwell on himself in the mirror even after dark. Note that dwell on has the meaning of focus on, so this is different from the meaning of the kanji, but it's a play on words that can reinforce my memory of the keyword even more. Heisig's keyword for this primitive is sow, meaning an adult female pig, but I added a second option, piglet, that is, piglet from the Winnie the Pooh series. It's fine to use both, since they're closely related, but piglet might provide a more vivid image for certain kanji. This kanji means pursue. It contains two primitives, sow and road. Imagine a swarm of 50 sows escaping from their farm and running down the road, with a desperate farmer pursuing them, trying to get them back. This kanji means drama, as in theater performance. It contains three primitives, tiger, piglet, and saber. But I'm going to modify tiger to tigger to fit in with piglet. And while saber, as in sword, is a decent keyword, I'm going to make it lightsaber. In this drama, this dramatic play, the climax consists of Tigger and Piglet having a duel with lightsabers. It's supposed to be a mere drama, just acting, but Tigger accidentally kills Piglet. Vivid images are great, and some of the most vivid images for you might be memories of things you've experienced. This kanji means window. It contains four primitives, house, human legs, elbow, and heart. For this kanji, I remember the time I came home after I'd forgotten my house key, so I had to get inside by climbing through a tiny window into the kitchen, which we left open for our cat. I imagined the image of my body half inside the house, with my human legs hanging outside. After finally squeezing through and landing on the kitchen floor, I had a sore elbow and my heart was racing from all the adrenaline. This really happened to me, actually four or five different times, so it's hard for me to forget. Memorizing so many kanji using simple rote memorization would be really hard, or at least take a long time, but using mnemonics, using your imagination and associations to help you remember is an extremely useful tool in your arsenal. It's also a heck of a lot more interesting than just drilling the same kanji a million times in order to remember it. So if you're learning Japanese kanji, have a look at Heisig's Remembering the Kanji and give it a try. Of course, it requires a lot of dedication to come up with stories for 2,000 different kanji, and you do have to review them in order to reinforce them, but people who complete the program and do their reviews rarely regret it. There's also a version for Chinese as well, which comes in two versions, simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese. 
But even if you don't use this specific method, the general idea of using your imagination and creativity as a memory tool is something that we can learn from it. Oh, and I must apologize for forgetting to explain this kanji, meaning apologize. This one contains two primitives, words and shoot, each of which have their own stories and can be broken down even further. This kanji represents an abusive husband. Every time he hurts his wife, he comes back to her and apologizes profusely. But this time, when she hears his words... The question of the day. To people who have used the Remembering the Kanji course to learn kanji, what was your experience with it? Did it help you remember the meanings of kanji? And to other people, do you use any kinds of memory techniques that help you learn characters, words, or other parts of a language? Let us know in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, then check out LangFocus on the various social media platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And as always, I want to say a very special thanks to all of my Patreon supporters, especially these amazing ones right here on the screen. They are my top tier Patreon supporters. Thank you very much to them. And to everyone, thank you for watching and have a nice day.